Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Kia ora, te ora, and welcome to the very first episode of Generally Famous. I'm Simon Bridges and each week I'll be talking to generally famous but always interesting guests about life, love and what makes them tick. Today, one of New Zealand's most successful sports people uh, with Olympic golds, uh, Halbergs, world records, I think I'm right to say 69 consecutive wins. Eric Murray, who's a rower, a golfer, six foot five, got that right, <laughs> six foot five. Um, uh, a Dancing with the Stars participant, a patron of Autism New Zealand, and the once proud owner of Handel Bartash. Uh, welcome to Generally Famous. Hey, great. I love, I love the title of your show. And I'm like... <laughs> Should we be like once famous? <laughs> I think you. I, I I think you more than fit the bill um, is definitely famous. We, yeah. Since we've been here and you walked in, I was rather saddened by the the number of staff members at the premises <laughs> were wanting selfies with you. Well, I sort of stand there forlornly like a loser. You know, I I because you were a politician. Yeah, pal. well, Come let's on. be honest. You know, <laughs> and not even liked, let alone loved. But hey, I I start with the I, li- I liked. I like to start with the big issues, the big questions, and so I do want to know whatever happened to the handlebar tash. Uh, yeah, I I love the handlebar moustache. It was basically uh, sort of my trademark while I was rowing, and then I just started growing it out more into the beard, you know, keep it sort of you a number... Yeah, number one, refined. number two, sort of the refined, I guess, masculine sort of beard style, you know, keep it under the chin, not too, too rough. Um, sort of the scruffy yet sort of tailored look at the same time. Um, so the renaissance man, sensitive new age guy that you are. Basically, yeah, trying to be that snag. Yeah, yeah. I think that's... A, well, because I, I would have thought the Tash would have... Um, it would have been, it's a sort of like a competitive advantage, advantage in the rowing boat, isn't it? It's, so, like a, it's like an otter through the water. The reason that I actually had it, funnily enough, was because I, I read something, and it's like years and years and years ago, and it was about intimidation, because in, <laughs> in, in rowing... <laughs> We're not a sport where it's not like the 100 metres and it's not like the rugby, you know, like you can get in people's face and, and, and you, you're trying to look intimidating as sort of an impressive. And so I always had it. So if you looked at me, you know, your glasses on and, the, and you had the facial hair. You know, when people look a bit scruffy and you're in a, a high pressure situation, you look twice and you're yes. like, OK. They're, they're ready for business. And that was really the reason why I started having the facial hair because yeah. if you're clean shaven, you know, you've done your hair. You probably don't look as intimidating as someone that looks scruffy. I actually think that's right. I yeah. mean, who do you want to go up against? You or Hamish Bond? I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, basically. Yeah, not, I mean, I'm not just talking. So, <laughs> and and actually, when you say it, when I when I think of you, cast my mind back. We're, we're talking like um, long boat Viking about to basically. step out of the the that's boat right. with a long sharp axe yep. to do some damage. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was it, and yeah, just kept that, um, you know. And everybody, it's a really so, but you know, I have been around and, and done a lot of events, and, and you see people in public, and obviously your name gets put out there more. But especially around the rowing time, I'd have so many times people go, "Hey, Mahe, Mahe," and, and I'll be like, "Hey, look, look, sorry, mate, I'm, I'm not actually Mahe, but but yes, I am one of the rowers." And and there was a couple of people on on two different occasions said, "Hey, look." My, oh, oh yeah! I knew you were that rowing guy, but I knew you had the moustache because it's really recognisable. <laughs> but of course, Mahe was such a unique name yes. that people like they put two and two together. Where if you if you weren't an avid sort of sports fan, you knew rowing, but the first thing that popped into your head was a unique name, which yes. was Mahe. But then you saw my face. So if you didn't, if you weren't part of it, if you if you didn't really have your finger on the pulse. You knew you just could you could relate the two together, so it was like, "Hey, Mahe," but it's like, "No, it's not Mahe; it's actually Eric." But hey, good, you know, good. At least, at least you get recognised. <laughs> oh, look, I, you are you are definitely generally famous, mate. I wouldn't get worried about that. I mean, the best I'd get is someone sort of looking at me and sort of saying, "Oh, did I go to school with you? You look familiar. Who are you?" Um, I, I want to talk with you about elite sports and uh, obviously rowing. And uh, you know, I think it's a fair assumption if anyone knows a bit about those things, you do. Uh, you still hold world records. Yeah, we actually twenty uh, eighth of July two thousand and twelve. We set the world record in the pair first day London Olympics. Amazing. So, um, yeah, it's we we still have that record to this day. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to get beaten in a in the short term. I hope 
in a way, in, in, in sort of any sport, right? You want it to because then you know that you've set a legacy. Oh, and you do not. S- no, nah, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, screw that. I don't you want do anyone. Not. I don't want anyone with uh, um, But yeah, no, we we still uh, hold the record. Um, I, I think the most impressive thing about our time in rowing was the our ability, and so, and I still scratch my head a lot thinking, how the hell did we not get beaten? Yeah. You know, and it, it's it's not like it. it it is baffling because you just we, we've never had a sport, and, and there's only been a few occasions around the globe in different sporting sort of uh, like areas where people have had such long winning streaks. You know, and we 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 went for eight years, and and it we just never ever lost a race. We had some very very close races, but we were never beaten. Yeah. And and that to me, you scratch your head thinking nobody in rowing history before it was us before we did our sixty nine um, races. It was about twenty two. Yeah, amazing. you know, and, and so amazing. not only did we surpass that, which it was decades before us, we blew that, obliterated that out of the water. And that and that you know, it, it's it's at one level it's not annoying because it's amazing to keep on winning. But at one level I suppose is there is a bit of a, a thing about that because you were so much ahead. You didn't. I suppose you did. You get cocky. No, the one we rowing as, as I said before about the whole intimidation thing. Um, if you disregarded your opposition, hmm. is the it. day that you're going to get yeah. like bitten in the butt, right? And 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 dare I say, you know, you can always use the terminology with the rugby and and it, because it's it's our national sport and everyone's oh we should beat so and so easily. Yes. Oh man, that was close. Oh yeah. shit, we got beaten. Um, and, and if you disregard your opposition, there's going to be that day where they're going to come out and they're going to throw the kitchen sink at you and beat you. Don't mention the Irish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but but look at it, right? It's just like, but you have to be on your game all the time. Yeah. We just managed to be able to make sure that we were on our game every time. And, mm. and our motivation and our philosophy going into it was like, let's do our best, okay? Mm. And 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 I know people will say, well, yeah, but you did more than your best. You were like un- unbeatable. Mm. But Every time we went into our into a race, and I can stand here hand on heart now and say that if we had got beaten by somebody, we would have been like, you know what, they were the better crew. But mm. we just made sure that we did exactly what we knew we were capable of achieving. And if you can do what you know you're capable of achieving, then you should be happy with the result. Yeah. And that's exactly how we approached everything all the time. We, we made sure that in our minds, especially after we were unbeaten for, for the first cycle, that you don't start bringing into your mind I hope we don't lose today. Mm. We still went out there with mm. like, let's win this race, you know, and do what we have to do right now in this moment. Don't look too far ahead. Mm. You know, you're, you're at the Olympics. You're not looking, like, because we should be in the final. Should is not going to happen. You've got to make sure each step along the way happens. So that was really how we focused it. One step at a time, get to the next round, uh, get through the next round after that. But you can't, you've got to think about the moment. And that was really the philosophy going through it. Yeah, no, positive in the moment. Um, if we go back to where it all started, Pukekohe High, I think I'm right to say, and obviously a shed load of training and discipline and all the things that go um, with that. Uh, it may sound like a silly question, but, well, no, maybe it's silly, but it's a very basic question, but why'd you do it? What, what, I, I suppose another way to say that is, well, well, because, you know, we were talking about this, it's off here. Um, if it was me at 5 a.m., I'd be like, well, I might go back to sleep and then there's some toast and... Um, a coffee a little bit later. I mean, what what got you out of bed? What, what what did you enjoy about rowing every day for what, a couple of decades? Yeah, to get into rowing, literally, time off school. <laughs> Kids, anyone listening, you want some time off school? Go rowing. Get into the rowing team. There's, there's heaps of hot chicks, hot boys, whichever way you want to go. And honestly, you time off school. Time off school. You'll love it. Yeah, it's hard work. But it does actually teach you a lot of life skills. You know, there's great camaraderie. Um, you you meet some fantastic people along the way. And that was really the goal. You know, and, and then you just get tapped on the shoulder by a few people and said, you could be pretty good at this. Um, and then it just led me down a path to be, you know, I, I had headed down to, to Lincoln Uni to start an ag science degree and, right. um, and then made a representative team. And so I ditched that to go into the New Zealand program and then, just one foot in front of the other and just climb the ladder through the so system. So you're not being um, unduly modest. You you did sort of fall into it. You enjoyed it. Young As a young whippersnapper, you kind of got into it. There was some good stuff about it. and Yeah. And and you obviously had huge national, natural talent. No. 
No, and that's one of the things, right? Okay, I was a big guy, and I was a bit, bit chubby at school, and and we we weren't the best, you know. Like, okay, we we won like an under seventeen quad at sort of the Marty Cup regatta, but it wasn't like I was in the single and I was and I was amazing. It wasn't like I was in the double and I was amazing. Whatever, um, I wasn't actually that great, but I just enjoyed the rowing. You know, and, and I say it to a lot of people now, one of the, you know, everyone goes, oh, but you're so talented. Uh, from my time coming through, I've seen so many talented people waste their talent. Mm. Okay, there are some people that just, they pick it up very easily or they've, mm. they've got it well. But the biggest talent in anything that we do these days is attitude. Mm. If you've got the attitude to follow it through, to keep going, no matter what it is, whether it's sport, business, life, if you've got that attitude to just keep going in, I'd much rather people with a better attitude yeah. who have the potential to grow than someone that sits there going, oh, I'm already winning, I'm good, I'm good, you know, I should be good all the yes. time. That, that is where it went. And I just had a really good attitude to take it through. So you possibly answered this then, but what, what makes the ultimate rower? Oh, the ability to learn, the ability to push themselves. And presumably yours, you know, you're a unit, you're six foot five, as I said, you, you know, you're a big guy. Presumably that is a huge natural yep. advantage. That said, of course, you're, uh, you know, amazing partner. And we might talk a little bit about that. Hamish Bond, I mean, he's he's a, a smaller guy. Yep. Um, so you've mentioned attitude, but I, I suppose if I put that another way, what, what really... Um, in addition to natural talent, discipline, it's what's going on yes. here and here, yep. that is your head and your heart, yep. and how you kind of, you know, you, you mentioned going into it for the girls or the guys, but, you know, you've actually got to um, get rid of a whole bunch of negative emotions, nerves, jealousy, intimidation, tiredness, actually the desire to go out with your girlfriend um, and muck around, because actually you've got to be... Yeah, yeah, and and if you commit to it like any, like commit to sport, but... I think it's life in general, right? And and one of, from what you're saying there, one of the most negative things that people always talk about is sacrifice, right? Okay. And through our time in rowing, I've never looked at anything as a sacrifice, way. right? What like what did I really sacrifice? I sacrificed a nine to five job. Shit, that was hard. <laughs> you know, like yeah. literally. You know, we went overseas. We I got paid by the taxpayer to, yeah. to sit on my ass. Although so, you have said, <laughs> I mean, that's true, but but you know, you have said you. you you're the world best for a yeah. long time, yeah. but rowing isn't golf. And we might, I know you're a great golfer. <laughs> you know, it doesn't come with a million no. of dollars of no. check. So, you know, to speak, I'm not an economist, but the economic phrase for this is opportunity cost. Yes. There's a cost. There was a cost in what you did. Yeah. And, and that's with anything, right? Yeah, it's true. like, well, like yeah, we, we had to like work effectively six days a week. No such thing as a public holiday, you know. We but we got to do some amazing things. We got to go represent our country, go try and be the best person that I could be to achieve my goals. To Hamish and I to come together and say, let's try and win the Olympics together as a team, as a partnership. Um, you know, and the opportunity cost was time away from family. Yeah. You know, but you you take it and you go. If you want to be a successful businessman, you want to be a CEO. You know, and you want to you want to take over the world. Um, the opportunity cost is the fact that you've got to do 15 hour days. Yeah. You know, like you're working, you're traveling overseas, you're doing huge yeah. amount of effort and people aren't going to like you. You're going to be, you know, disliked by a lot of people. You've got to be hard nosed. You know, so your opportunity cost is not spending time with your kids mm. or um, being looked upon as being really tough, you know. And so no matter what you do in society and life, there's always opportunity costs, you know, and, and that's really what we came to to think about was that, yeah, we, we've got the attitude, we want to get to this point, um, and we just really had to make sure that we did it in a way that was that was going to pay off, yep. um, you know, and, and having that high-performance program that really was driving us through. Um, you know, without that, I still think, you know, we, we probably would never have got to the position that we have. Right, right. You know, we've, we've got a great program in New Zealand with sport. I definitely think it needs to be adjusted, um, but at the same time, um, it, you've got to have that attitude. You've got to be a person that wants to win. I mean, not knowing enough about it, you know, so I speak from uh, a certain comparison to your high degree of ignorance, but um, it requires a lot of cash, though, doesn't it? I mean, I think that if I look at Aussies versus New Zealand, my sense is they, they throw so much money yep. at stuff. And that's, you know, so whereas over here, we're lean, mean, you know. We are, we are. And, and, and as a country, we, we do punch well above our weight. Um, I think we do have a, a very, very good ratio of 
Olympic medals to spend. Mm-hmm. I think we have one of the most efficient in the world. Probably easy because we, 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 we are a smaller country. Um, but you do need resource to be, is to be able to do it. Um, and, and that resource comes at a cost because it's like, you know, we're, we're trying to spend a lot of money on our athletes, but could that be used in better fashion? Yep. Or are we, can we put more at it? Are we going to get more results? And, and obviously it's been quite pivotal, you know, in the media and everything with yep. our medals worth more than mental health. Yep. Um, it's a very, very, very interesting balance because... Quite complex. Uh, very complex. Yep. And I don't know the answer. And, I, and, and I, I think we've got some very good people in there with Raylene Castle. Yep. Um, you know, she's had a huge amount of experience overseas with a, with a lot of stuff. Um, and it is trying to find that balance for people because ultimately, you know, we went through a generational... Uh, we went through a generation of this is how it was done. Right, and the next generation that are coming through now do it a completely different way. Yep. They're technology based. Um, the way that they went through school in terms of like the pressure that was put on them, yep. you know, sport was more about uh, participation, not competition. Yep. So we, we've got a very big shift in the way that our sporting culture in mm. the country looks, um, and so we really have to adapt to that because. On one side, if we just want everyone to participate, do we even care about going to the Olympics? Yeah. Or do we still want to have that competitive aspect at the same time? And where do you draw the line? What age? You know, because you and Did I... Did you get a certificate oh. for turning up Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> <laughs> no, I got, I'll see you later. you got COVID. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd like to ask you about your... Um, just briefly, quick fire in a sense. When, when you were at the top, your daily regime? Uh, yeah, tw- uh, at least two or three times a day. Um Six days a week, so we do twelve to fourteen sessions. Give you some numbers: average two hundred to two fifty k's a week on the water, um, sure. ten thousand k's a year, forty thousand every Olympic cycle. Daily diet, uh, as much as you can eat. Anything and everything. Uh, good food first, um, <laughs> and then calories second. Hamish used to say that he was a competitive eater. Me, not so much, because right. I'm I even now still hold the weight, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. But I, but I but as you say, back then yeah. you could eat anything. Pretty much, yeah. you're just it's it's work. It, it's just the the classic body. You know how much energy you expend, you need to replace. Yeah. And when we're burning four, five thousand, six thousand calories a day, depending on the day, you're eating five, six plus your Amazing. your natural two thousand that you're doing. So you're just like, give me what to I me, can. That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> oh, it was wonderful in a way, but then sometimes when you're so tired and you know you need to be eating, right. eating did become a chore on right. occasions. Right. And the really heavy times, you're sort of sitting there like chomping away on like a big bowl of porridge and you're like, man, I just, this is, this is hard. Yeah. But it's all part of what you're doing. Yeah. Right? And if you don't eat, you don't recover and don't can't no. perform. And no. it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole complex balance being an athlete. People think it's just like train whatever. There's a huge amount that goes on. And, and it's time, you know, specific training time wasn't a, a lot. You know, it was probably four to five hours on the water a day, max, like maximum. But then there's everything that goes around it, getting prepared, warming up, sitting down, doing analysis, going to see the physio, you know, working on your core, ex, like everything like that that comes into it. It's a lot. And, and to be fair, I take my hat off at the coaches, you yeah. know, because they did way more than we did. Right. They're there before we turn up. They're there after we leave. You know, and and they're they're the unsung heroes yep. of us. You know, and, yep. and even right down to community coaches. Yep. Um, every time I hear someone doing a coaching job, I'm like, well done. You guys are great. It's amazing. Yeah, they're the heroes. Um, you and Hamish Bond, obviously amazing, successful partnership. Da da da. You know all of that. But you're quite different characters, as my. You know, very <laughs> oh, different characters. So different. So where how'd you make it work? Uh so Hamish summed it up one time. And he said, when we got on the pier, I knew that I was the best and Eric was second best. I was like, come on, bro. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> and and, and so, uh, so basically, we, we had two people who thought we, that they were the best. Yeah. Um, Hamish, was an, he's an amazing athlete, physiologically uh, epic. In a way, and because he's not here to defend himself. Sorry, Hamish. Um, <laughs> you know, in a way, you almost sort of related it to that, like, Small man syndrome, <laughs> right? But he wasn't, you know. He's he was How still. How tall is he? Uh, he's like six one and a half. Right. He was a couple of inches shorter, but he was ten kgs lighter. So right. Hamish on the world stage, one of the smaller athletes. Yes. But he all he wanted to do was just beat people. He was yeah. just so competitive, and he had the physiology to do it at the same time. So he would just he would just be like, I'm going to pick off the biggest guy and see if I can beat him. 
You know, he was like, he's just that little terrier, you know, that just just wanted to win all the time. And so his competitive nature, plus the fact that he's he's very much a pessimist, you know, and he's 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 a um, he's got a degree in financial planning, so he's right. sort of he's very articulate it's with all those. his numbers, you know. So right. that's he was very planny, you know, make sure everything's right, everything where. I'm the eternal optimist, man. I'm like, should we right? We're good, good, good. You know, sweet as, you know, I oh, don't worry about that. Um, and so we really had to balance out those those two differences between us. Because I don't us. think you, I think I, I think I read somewhere once, you, you two didn't, um, I mean, what, there weren't arguments. No. You, you guys, no. you know, you got on well. So one, You obviously were yin to the yang. and We, we absolutely were. And, and probably the, when, when we, and, and both reluctantly, I guess, afterwards, hindsight, this is always a great thing. Uh, Hamish said that two Hamish Bonds in the boat wouldn't have been as good as Eric and Hamish. Yeah. And I can definitely say that two Eric Murrays in a boat <laughs> together were not as good as Eric and Hamish. What would have happened if there were two Eric Murrays? Oh, so much power. We probably wouldn't have got on the water. <laughs> we would have stayed at the pub. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, but but <clears throat> when, we were in the, when we were in the crew together, we, we, it was never really talked about. There was no leader. Like Hamish, Hamish drove the the rhythm of the boat i i was steering i was doing all the calling and and bits and pieces but there was no boss you know we weren't a partnership where like you're you're always doing the media or you're the one that they always come and talk to it was it was very much a 50 50 relationship because if if i brought something to the table and i said look we're not doing this right in our training or in the technique i really feel like we need to clean this up Hamish should go, okay, so what do you suggest? And then if, if he was the same, he's like, I think we should change our setup because I don't like it. I think we could be better with that way. I'll be like, sweet ass. Because whatever either of us brought to the table, we're only saying it so that we go better. We're yeah. not saying it for shits and giggles. No. We are saying it because we think it's going to make our yeah. boat faster, our, our dynamic better. Um, and because of that, we never had that position where it's like, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm, you know, I'm in charge here, whatever. So we really managed to get that dynamic very good. And it's and and I will be open and honest. It's easy. It's only two of us, mm. you know. And conflict resolution as well mm. because you're not losing. Mm. You don't have to ask the hard questions. Mm. <laughs> do, you, do you see him? You see him or not all? Do you see him much now? Uh, I ha- I haven't seen him for a while. He's actually yeah. just shot off to America for a year. Right. So his uh, wife Elizabeth is um, Lizzie. She is a surgeon. Right. So she's gone to do a fellowship over at uh, one mm. of the universities in America. So Amazing. we're basically just on messenger. Yeah. Hey man, what's up? <laughs> well, I suppose that's life, right? Some of you so close to. I think my life uh, for a season, and then it's kind of like it's not. You'll always be. Yeah. You'll always be a pair at a level, a, but you're not. You're not seeing each other. All yeah. Time, yeah. And that was, I think, one of the best parts about Hamish and I is we we really did manage that that relationship well okay and in terms of it was like a business relationship right if you've got a partnership between people you need to be working on things and you need to be on the same page most of the time for it to be working well but then when you leave when when you leave your work behind your your own person so when we left rowing i'd be like sweet see you in the morning it's not like, hey, let's should we go to the pub tonight, or should we go out for dinner, or should we go to the cafe, whatever. It was like, you do your life, I'll do my life. But then when we come back together, we're on the hip together, focusing on everything, talking about everything together, making the decision making together, um, and and that's really what worked. Rather than if you're living in each other's pockets and and you, things start to get a bit frayed, and we we didn't, and people people and I still wonder how it didn't happen. We never had an argument. We never Amazing. like once sat in the boat going, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. You Sounds know, like, like me and my wife. Well, Not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's probably how it had to be. Do you have, I'm just interested with all of your, I genuinely, genuinely am interested, with all of your success, the ribbons, the trophies, the medals, the certificates, the, do you have a trophy room? Uh, I've got a little trophy corner that I built in a house that I've been renovating. A shrine. In yeah, it does. It's got these, <laughs> uh, cut these these silver goblets from Henley, and the Halberg trophies are sitting on the top, and then there's a platter, this big silver um, like platter, and it's got all my medals and stuff on it, and then gold medals are sitting there, and uh, there's a Lonsdale cup there from the NZOC. So it's sort of, because at the time, like unless you really do put them in something or what, put them somewhere. Yeah, yeah, well, you just, like it, 
to be fair, you, t- you talk to a lot of um, athletes about, oh, where do you keep your gold medal? And it literally, a lot of the time, it's in the sock drawer. Yeah. Because it's the easiest way to carry it around. They do come keep in a, it in the sock. Well, they, they do become in a, in a presentation case. Yes. But to keep it in the presentation case, you've got to take the, like, the middle piece out and you've got to wrap the ribbon around the back and then shut it. And of course, when you take it to an event or whatever, or if you bring it out to show someone, then you've got to rewrap it all back in there. But but if you're going to carry it somewhere, it's like in a sock, not going to get banged around, in the pocket, boom. And then when you get home, you're like, sock drawer, sweet, I know where the metal is. And no one's going to go and like, if your house gets robbed, who's going to go in your sock drawer? See, I would. <laughs> not that I'm doing the eye, because I, 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 I think that's where the valuable stuff often is. Yeah, it's all, it should, well, it should be, right? With your undies and that, because it's like, no one's going to go <laughs> the in the crown jewels, undies. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> I love beautiful products of real quality. And Trade Depot actually has them all. Kitchens, bathrooms, appliances, but much more. Laundry, heat pumps, lighting, tools, hardware, and on and on. Actually, over 4,500, as I say, beautiful, real quality products. And what's even better than that is they're at affordable prices, which really matters right now, even to West Auckland stops like myself. Trade Depot can do that because it's buying in volume so it can pass on savings and it's working on tiny margins. Oh, and it's New Zealand owned. So it understands us and our mindset and that matters a lot to me. Check it out at tradedepot.co.nz or if you're old school like me, actually why don't you head into one of their stores in Auckland, Christchurch or their new superstore in Hamilton near the airport. It's not all trophies, beer and skittles, um, and it, it takes its toll. What you've done in, in elite sports, and there's a dark side, and I suppose that's true. It's but your point you made around business, etc. That's true. Of anything when you sort of yep. at the top and you're going at it, right? There's a, there's that, and it's, you know, it's certainly surprise, surprise to everyone who's listening. That's true in politics as well. Many New Zealanders were impacted by the death of Olivia Podmore last year, and you know, elite cyclist who died at age 24 after a troubling media post um, in part about the pressure around elite sports and you obviously were you know, my sense and you know, I think more than my sense were close mm. and in fact spokesperson I thought the statement you made um, was very powerful where you said you know um, that you know um, her passing left a, a, us a message um, around mental health and elite sports, and it reverberates, you know, through the sporting yeah. world. Actually, yep. um, I, I mean, I could just say, talk to me about that. But I suppose a question is, how, how do you assess her passing now, and, and 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 what what sort of wider meaning do you we should we take from it? Yeah, there was there was a lot, you know, with Paul Liv. Um, things that happened to her in trauma in the past were definitely. They were the underlying factors. And then the sporting stuff on top of that got to a point where she felt worthless. Mm. Um, and I think that's a lot of thing with a lot of people where, which, you know, suspected suicides and stuff like that, where you you feel worthless, like you feel like you're not meant to be there. And with the sport and the way that it was going, a lot of it, you know, I we had many, many chats at home around the table and just, and she's like, you know, oh, but, you know, this, they don't want me. I'm not good enough. And I'm like, yeah, but you are. I'm like, there's just some really shit things that are happening with your selection, you know, and and it was really, really unfortunate. And I was like, look, you've got to try. You know, I thought we had broken through, you know, but the problem is when when you've qualified for the Olympics and they take your space away and give it to someone else and you're not really getting the answers as to why and you're not getting the opportunities and you're giving all this time and all this effort to a sport. You know, one of, that was one of one of many factors which really just that broke the camel's back. At this point, I just want to note that if anyone listening is struggling with their mental health, there's a huge range of organisations who can help. They include the 1737 helpline, which offers assistance from a trained counsellor. You can text or call for free 24 hours a day. I think you're definitely right. I mean, the, what I've read in the, the newspapers uh, and online, um, there's obviously a bunch of things 
together that yep. led to where uh, it, it tragically got to. Is there though a sense, you know, that in elite, elite sports, it um, it they whatever make it too hard, and and I suppose it comes back to that conflict you've already kind of alluded to when we we're talking a bit earlier between um, mental health and well-being and winning, yep. and you know, um, without being at all glib about it, given the seriousness of what we're talking about, but you know, kind of like, um, yeah, not not p- participation versus you know. We want winners, and that's what we're going for. Sport, and the whole time that I've been involved, is about medals. Yeah, always has been. Right, the government funding. It's like we've got to see, you've got to see result for the money that you're putting in. And you know, we had it on a couple of occasions. Um, one time, I was going to come back for the birth of my son, and they did not like the fact they were like, "This is going to ruin your chances of winning gold medal." And I'm like, it "Doesn't matter." This is what I want to do. I want to be back here for his birth, you know. And and they're like, yeah. And so then they're asking Hamish, going, oh, look, this is going to affect your chance of winning. So what, what are you doing here? You know, there, there's a classic example. Like I I I was a better person to 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 realise, look, I'm I'm going to do it, and I don't think it's going to affect. They're not going to get rid of me because I think I'm good enough to not yeah, yeah. Have, have it happen. But it's still the question was put out there, you know. And so it's always been the case because we do want the medals, and and it's. And unless you change the model and you don't care, I think that's probably the right word. You don't care as as a public that our athletes are going to get like retainers or funded, and they're not actually super. Well, they are focused on winning the gold medals, but instead of it being a, a results based model and for the funding, it becomes like a here's some money, try and get a medal, and then we'll reward you after with a bit more bonus stuff. Which one do you want to have? You know, if it's going to stop um, things like this happening again, uh, let's do it. You know, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> you've been in politics and government. You know, those decision making things around that type of funding and taxpayers' money and and everything else is a really really difficult balance yeah. to find. Yeah. Um, you know, but we have always been about trying to get those results. It's mm. always been the case, and I. I, what I said before about a generational shift, yes, I think it needs to change. I think that it, there needs to be some sort of way that you can have minimum minimum amount of funding to help somebody on their journey to a degree, right? You still can't just give it to everybody. No. Still has to be criteria. There still has to be numbers. Like yeah. we can't just go here. Let's have a hundred rowers, right? You got to you got to keep the numbers as as needed. And then they're like, look, if you this is going to help help you get to a point, and then if you achieve and you win some medals or you make the final or you you show excellence, we'll give you a little bit more on top of that. Because at the moment the funding model is clear cut, and it's it's written in paper, it's online, you can actually see it. You know, it's 60k a year if you win, 55 for medals, and it just goes down in a tier system from there until you're basically half of your field. That's it, right? It's all published. Because it's taxpayers' money, it has to be. Mm. But should it be changed slightly? Should it be everybody gets a 25k a year, and then there's a model on top of that? Would that help people? Yes, because if you get cut from the team, you get nothing. It's yeah. like you're out. Sorry, you didn't get selected. There's no, there's there's very very small amounts of discretionary. Hey, we'll keep you in the squad. But when you're in the squad, doesn't mean you're getting funding because the funding's now gone to the people that are in the squad mm. that are actually going. So that's a lot of it comes around from security because if you're someone that's just been dropped or you get injured, what are you doing? You know, like you're you're wanting to be part of it, but you can't be, and you're not going to get the results. So, yeah, it's it's a very very complex situation. And I, and I suppose though, you know, um, it is. Although, you know, going back to your you know very your big example, right, of you and the birth of your son, you were at the top of the tree. Right, so as you say, you, they weren't getting rid of you, but if you were... But they asked the question. So, so they're asking the question to somebody that's won. And I suppose the point is, if, if you were down at the start and you hadn't got gold and you weren't at the top, they wouldn't. would they have asked the question? Shouldn't they? Or would it have been a ruling? Oh, it would have been a ruling. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and I think, you know, we, we had that example in rowing, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy to say that it has changed. Yeah. But... You know, that's we're talking ten years ago that yep. that sort of question was being asked. It's not that long ago. But you say it's changed. Do you think, to your knowledge of it, that the review or inquiry that's come from uh, Olivia's lives passing, um, it's going to see change? Oh yeah, yeah. It's definitely going to see change. 
Um, I'm not sure how long it's going to take to get implemented, but the one thing that we've got, you know, as tragic as it is, if this can change the way that it works, not only for, say, cycling, but for all of our national sporting organisations, we can have an amazing future for our next generation coming through. And I think you've got to look, yes, there's been, there's been tragedy, but out of most things, when you, when you have that tragedy, you know, can, can we bring the phoenix out of the ashes? Can we bring something up that now our next generation of, of kids that are coming through that go, look, I want to be a cyclist or I want to play hockey or, or you know, play basketball, whatever, can they absolutely flourish? Can, they, can, we, can we actually set a standard in New Zealand that can be looked upon as a model for other places around the world that could completely change, you know, and, and maybe not this next Olympic cycle, the next one. Maybe we could have so many more people on, on the dais yeah. and they're finishing or or if they don't quite reach it, because it's easy to talk to me about, you know, oh you had a great you had a great career. I had mates who went through the same time as I did, mm. left with nothing. Mm. You know, that you need to talk to them about mental health. Don't talk to me about mental health. Mm. You know, talk to them, how do they feel? Because a lot of them are like, well, I tried, just didn't quite get there. Yeah. You know, and, and that's really the difficult conversations to have because there's a lot of people out there who spend their time trying to get to the top and never do. That said, it has taken a toll on you. I mean, you, you've commented publicly that, um, you know, the ending of your marriage, I'm sure it's like all these things. We talk about many things, mm. but a part of it was, you know, you weren't there. You were out on the road or the water, uh, yep. as, as it were. I mean, is that just the cost you pay or do you have um i don't know if i want to say regrets but regrets would no, you do I, things differently I, I don't think i'd do anything differently yeah um oh no i would i wouldn't row i'd play golf <laughs> <laughs> would you would you be, would you be at masters well, oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no i don't think i would you know um it was you you try and think about it but everything's a learning experience you know and it's molded me into the person that I am today. Yeah. Um. You know, and and uh, was was there bad things along the way? Hundred percent. You know, yeah. was there was there things I probably should have uh, thought about or, you know, <laughs> engaged the brain before you open the mouth. Uh, I'm, well, you I'm are sure a you're man. The, yeah, are you the same. I, know, you're the same I, know, power, I understand the concepts. <laughs> you know, not from personal experience, of course. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. But no, no. I no. I think I've. I'm pretty happy with the outcome. Um, incidentally, I was going to say, well, I'm going to say, you, you, what's interesting about you, well, there's many th- interesting things, but you, you're, you uh, and I'm the same, actually, some say I'm an over-discloser, um, you, you're a very open person. I mean, actually, there's a lot of people in your position at the top of all sorts of things, but certainly sports who guard their privacy and, you know, their story, if you like, very jealously, and they don't talk about it. I mean, what's, you agree with that? Uh, I really just don't have a lot to hide. Yeah. You know, it's not like I've done anything really bad <laughs> that I don't want people to know about. No. Um, you know, the story's there and it's open to tell. And, and a lot of the time I, I feel, I don't know, I don't know where it comes from, but I almost feel a willingness that I need to give back. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I have no idea. But, you know, people will be like, oh, you want to share? Yeah, sure. I'll share my story. You know, it's like, you know, I don't want to say, oh, this is how we did, you know, this is why we got good or this is how we got successful and this is our setup of our stuff. You know, I'm like, oh, if you want to know, I'll tell you. You know, it's like if that can help somebody else. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm a, like a super selfish person. I just really, um, I'm very, as I say, I don't know if it's my optimism, but just general friendly guy. Um, yeah, just loves having a good time for your beers. Except when you're on the order with that Vikings tag. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and in terms of that giving uh, giving back, I mean, you, you uh, I think I'm right, patron autism New, New Zealand. Zealand. Yep. And obviously I have a sense why, but tell us about that. Yeah, so when I was, uh, so when when uh, my ex-wife and I had, had Zach, um, he was at daycare, sort of, he was coming up sort of two, nearly three, and he just really wasn't communicating very well. Um, so you take him to the doctor and they're like, nah, ears are clear and bits and pieces. And they said, oh, look, we think we should take him to see a pediatrician and um, child development centre. And they're like, oh, we think your son's got autism. Um, so basically you go down the, the route of, of having a child with special needs. Uh, and basically, yeah, it was just navigating how his pathway was going to look going forward. Um, and so you just you just set a path on, on what that, what that's going to look like. And then over time, you know, as he starts school and, and he goes through all the bits and pieces and you look at the funding that's needed for him to be to be part of, of school and education. Um, once I sort of finished after Rio, I was he was turning five. 
And I started school with him and I was going to school and we were seeing what he needed and, and he just needed a lot of hands-on because he was he was more focused about being out in the playground than he was being in the classroom. Um, and then basically we were like, look, this isn't going to work. We need to get him into a school, um, like special needs school, that really can focus and get him to focus and, and, and unleash his talents, basically. Uh, and that's what we've done. Um, and then over time, Obviously, with my profile, you do things in the media and, and you're open and honest about your child having autism because it's it's just autism, mm. right? It's just a different operating system. Mm. Um, and basically got approached by Autism New Zealand to be like, hey, do you want to be the patron and, and you know help us advocate for our community? And I was like, 100%, here we go. Um, and so, you know, been lucky enough to do, you know, Treasure Island and Dancing with the Stars and um, a lot mm -hmm. of other different fundraisers around mm. and, and really just try as much as we can for our, our community of people with autism to just help them out, you know, and to get understanding, not, not even to, to that community, but to everybody else to say, look, there is a lot of people in the world that are slightly different than what you are, yeah. you know, and have that understanding. Give autism and give autistic people a voice. Yeah. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to advocate for. It's you know, big numbers, right? Uh, it is big numbers. And there's and the, the, a lot of what we're trying to do, it does affect a lot of families. But at the same time, you know, there's so many things in society that affect sure. a lot of different families. Um, and it's really just trying to find a way for people that might be just misunderstood, you know, to, to really give them the voice and, and help them out because a lot of, uh, you know, a lot more people now are getting picked up with just with idiosyncrasies or, you know, just the ability. They, they just don't like being around crowds or spaces and just they that's who they are. That's yep. their identity yep. um, to give them a voice. So I've been I've been very privileged to be in that position and I'll keep doing whatever I can to and help And how's out. Zach? And to tell us about him and how do you see his future? Uh, yeah, well, I, as I say, we're navigating that at the moment, getting his communication working a lot he's more. he's 10? Uh, he's just turned 11 now, Great. actually. Yeah, a little bugger. Crikey. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like You must be old. Yeah, mate, I, I clicked the big 4 out this year. <laughs> celebrate it? We celebrated that hard. Oh, <laughs> man, that's a big one. That's a once in a decade party that was in Cambridge, <laughs> man. Um, but yeah, like with Zach, we, we, you find his interests and, and you work with him and you get his routines and he's great. Um, but then there's a lot of things that can trigger, you know, and, and you're out and about and he's not comfortable and you're like, we've got to leave. You know, but you've got to learn that to find out how he's going to look in society when he gets older. Um, and, and that's really what we're doing at the moment, just navigating, finding out his needs, what's going to need to happen. Because there there are a lot of people in society that, that need that help, you know, that need different things. And it's a lot of it unfortunately falls back onto parents and individuals because our health systems I can't really swear um <laughs> starts with f <laughs> it's it's a little bit um yeah, yeah you know and and there's a lot we we are lacking in a lot of areas yeah. and it's not just in in like with autism and stuff like that there's a lot there's a lot you know and it's it, it's it is sad, but it's just you know I don't know how we we change it. It's you got to have people advocating all the time, mm. you know. Squeaky wheel, it's the oil, you know. And I'll just keep being as squeaky as I need to be to that. But he loves coming golfing. Problem is he's eleven and he thinks he can drive the cart at the moment. <laughs> and I'm like, no way, Paolo. You just not quite yet. Um, but you know he'll be outside. Wants to be outside. Um, you know, I've been renovating a place in Cambridge and it's been wonderful and he's been helping with that. Tries to paint, not that great. Have to <laughs> unplug the power tools, otherwise they're going to get used. Um, you know, and, and he loves water, you know, loves being in a pool. So, right. you know, I was like, instead of flipping my house, obviously house prices went ridiculous. Um, I borrowed some money and put in a pool, yeah. you know, and, and this summer is going to be amazing, you know, Fantastic. and it will really help him out in his therapy and everything and it will just it'll just put him to another level. So um, apart from the fact that I put a little putting green beside it as well. So <laughs> he'll be swimming and I'll be out there, there with my putter and Brilliant. balls in the hole. <laughs> Brilliant. Sounds good. And and of course as you say you have not so long ago done dancing with the stars before <laughs> victory was cruelly ripped from your hands because won. of COVID. <laughs> Do you think you're, so? You're hearing that Jess? No, I'm just <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um yeah well you enjoy I, it? I, I did enjoy it. I'll tell you what, I wasn't prepared 
for what was going to happen. Run me through uh, that. Well, you know, well, that's like, been my basic experience of ridiculous <laughs> game show <laughs> entertainment things <laughs> I've done. It's, yeah, and, and about you know, and it's sort of about forty three minutes, and you say to yourself, "Why did I do this?" Yeah, I, Who I, signed me up? I had I had the the philosophy and the work ethic to go. Okay, I can train. I can learn a new skill. Yeah. Um, with everything else that went around it in terms of... And you understand competition. I, I understand competition, but at the same time, I've always been a realistic person. So when we started dancing and you get through the first week, I was like, I think I'm mid-pack. I don't think I'm going to win. You know, like, you you have that idea, but because it's a game show, or, you know, television show, there's public vote and then there's your dancing ability. And I thought my dancing ability was... Average or above. <laughs> but then I thought on the other side, I had probably above average support from the country. Yeah. You know, and it was like, here's this guy, a big guy getting out there trying to do it. Yep, love it. And, and so you, you get realistic about how it's going to look. Um, but learning that new skill, amazing. You know, I take, honestly, those professional dancers, beautiful. Yeah. And you, they go into studio and like, here's us trying to learn, say like, 10 or 12 seconds worth of dance moves for the introduction of the show and they'll learn something that's going to take a minute and about two or three and I'm like how did you remember that I'm like Lauren how did you do that and she's like oh you know but it's just this 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 and this and this and this and this and this and this I'm like hang on when you told me to go left right left step to the side I forgot that I went left right left I went right left went to the right not the left you know it's like oh my god and so yeah it's it but in terms of it, you know, it's it's one of these things, being able to have the ability to, to get your voice, you know, to be able to be on there for Autism New Zealand. You know, that was it. You know, yes, it's Eric Murray out raise, there. Raise good money? We did raise good money. Very, very good money. Amazing. For everybody. And I think that's the one thing. That show does a great opportunity as a platform for people. Um, you know, in, in all different walks of life, we had such great variety of, ch- of charities um, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, being part of that um, was 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 a great opportunity. And you're such a sucker for punishment. You've done Celebrity Treasure Island and <laughs> yeah. some. You'd be great on that. I reckon you. Well, you should sign up. I, I have. I, I will say I have been asked with dance on on Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> but my I, I know my limits. Uh, you look. You never say never. Who knows? And go, golf a, a, a three handicap. You know, yeah. slouch on. You know, as you say. If at age sort of thirteen or fourteen, you'd you'd yeah, push I know. that way. I should have. I should. Oh yeah, but hey, that's hindsight. That's hindsight. But I I, I loved golf when I was a kid. Um, my dad used to play it at Maramaru. We lived in Bombay, and and I'd go down. Oh, and I know I, that and I, course. Yeah, about, yeah, yeah. Loved and I and I got into it. Rowing took over. Parked the golf. Went to the rowing. I really wish I had done some of it while I was training. Unfortunately, because we went to some beautiful countries around the world. Mm. Um, and then, but ever since I sort of came back, uh, finished sort of 2018, just slowly got back into it, and it's become like my hobby, you know. So you're, you're so how often you play? Uh, I'll play. I'll try and play once a week. Right. Um, you know, very lucky I can go to St Peter's uh, School in Cambridge, and they yep. have a golf academy, so you can you can pay to to hit balls there after school hours and sometimes during school hours, and you get a few lessons, and um, it's been great just learning that skill and and golf like i think i've got the i've definitely got the patience because i've got a few mates eh? and they, man they can throw some clubs we, we were going to have like a world <laughs> we were thinking about having like a club throwing challenge because those guys man they get angry um <laughs> but it, it's golf you know this worldwide sport that i think people have all tried and or they know about it you know and and to try and be good at it is as what is as is, is, is crazy so go dare oh. i ask is a ridiculous question Golf v rowing or different oh, phases? Oh, so much harder. Well, golf's got so many variables. Yeah, that's right. So it's much more multi-dimensional. Oh, yeah, huge. Times, you know, and, and it's like, but, but nobody's ever perfected golf. No. Like, I'd say we got reasonably close. Like, if, if you're breaking world records and bits and pieces. You were doing everything that could be done. I'm trying. In, in but, rowing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yet you, you're still in golf. Like, there's no one's ever cracked Never, yeah. no one's ever cracked the code. Some people have done some amazing things, and that's absolutely a head and heart game. Yeah, yeah, and you have to be, you know. And but it's a great social game as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, rowing wasn't really social; it was competitive. Whereas you look at golf, it can be competitive, but it can be social. 
you know, you, you get that crossover between it being a sport and a game, you know, yeah. like, and, and, and you can you can go out with your mates and whatever handicap you're playing on, you know, it's a great system to be able to actually play it and you can be you can be terrible, you know, you could be a 30 handicapper and play against someone that's scratch, but you can beat them in terms of the actual game of golf mm. of the scoring system, mm. um, you know, and, and but, but it is fun, you know, and, and I really enjoy going out there. You get outside, you're walking around the golf course and... You can just refresh, you know, and I think that's a lot of what I've tried to find is, is just filling the void in terms of I, I left a very competitive environment and I felt like I'd done enough to like, I don't need to go back to a super competitive environment. Like I've been in that for, for nearly 20 years, you know, and so I'm like, look, just find something that's going to tick the boxes of, of being enjoyable, um, great for your health, mental health. Um, and really, golf filled that void. Fantastic. What's the future hold for you? Um, it's just a small question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Holy moly. Well, at the moment, I, I work business development, a um, company called ErgFit, and we, we sell a lot of fitness gear, especially like the indoor rowing machine. And yep. um, I, I work with a tech company. We do some coaching programs for people that use the rowing machines. Um, I'm actually on an indoor rowing commission with with FISA, our world governing body of rowing, to develop it as a standalone sport, like a discipline. Right. Um, so there's some <laughs> there's some four to five a.m. Zoom meetings around yeah, the globe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. damn it, New Zealand time zone. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot going on in that space, and and as I say, outside of it, in terms of life, there's a lot going on with Zach. Um, you know, and and been renovating, which has been fun. Just, just finding things that are, that are making life enjoyable. So I think I know the answer to this thing. You, you're not a guy who, because a lot of really top athletes and sportsmen um, struggle post being at the top to find their thing to kind of, you know, establish what they're doing. That doesn't sound like that's you. No, it hasn't particularly. And two reasons. One, I had good opportunities on exit. I think a lot of people that struggle don't have an exit plan as such. Hmm. I didn't really have an exit plan either, but I had an opportunity that was that arose basically like when when you finish come and see me, you know, that type of thing. Hmm. Um, but I'd also been in the workforce and and I think this is one of the when we go back to that conversation about mental health and sport, part of it is you get people that have no idea what they're doing. A lot of our issues I've found, and, and, I, and I'm only theorising with, with how it is, is that people are plucked out of school straight into development programmes. Uh, yeah, we've got great opportunities with education. Dare I say it? It's great. It's awesome, right? But then you're 20, late into your late 20s and you're going to forget your sport. I'm out of here. you got double degree because Prime Minister's scholarships all paid for it. But you've got no experience. Right, so I had experience working for, for for nearly six, seven years, earning enough money to do the sport. So I had that work balance. I, I knew what the working society was like, and then I jumped back into it once I left. Whereas you're finding a whole lot of people who have been an athlete, but an athlete in working society is completely different. Mm. You know, yes, you've got some great skills that are going to help and translate across, but unless you really have that environment of working and knowing what the daily grind is like. Um, you might have a sporting grind, but there's a big difference in terms of a work balance and a work work life. Um, I really had that position to be able to go into it, and then it was really just about knowing. Yep, that's uh, that's exactly what I was I was able to do, um, and then I've just developed that from that point. So I didn't have that downer because at the same time, and <laughs> and I'll be completely open about it. I tapped out when I wanted to, yeah. you know. And makes that's, a big difference. That is a huge yeah. difference, you know, when you I, get I when you get dropped, exactly right. um, or you for whatever reason you don't want to leave, or you're not ready, or you haven't achieved what you wanted to, and you've got regrets. That is where mm. things start to get. No, politics and sport have their similarities. <laughs> <laughs> to finish, I want to ask you three incredibly important oh, questions that I'm going to ask uh, every uh, guest, and it's a section I call general knowledge. What single object would you save from your house? And it can't be the metal in the sock. Probably Zach. Yeah. <laughs> Is it an object? That's a reason he got us. But let's go. Let's go. Let's go inanimate. Uh, I honestly, I don't really care. I don't care. Like if everything can be replaced. Um, 
everything, all your photos and everything now are on a cloud yeah. server. You know, it's not like, oh, here's our wedding photo or, what, or whatever you've got as a, you know, as a person that you'd have. Um, I don't have anything that if I lost, I couldn't replace. Um, and I think... Those Callaways are gone. Uh, no, nah, Taylor Maids, they're in the garage. Taylor. They're in the garage. They're actually sitting in the, they're actually sitting in the car yeah. at the moment. Right. Um, no, I, I, do, I really, no, nah, honestly, let it go and I'll replace it. What is the best night you've ever had? And I've, I've you've, you've alluded to this 40th. Um, yeah, that was Wait, yeah, re- might, recently. I'm not trying to push you in any direction, you... <laughs> Is this R eighteen? Is this R eighteen? <laughs> uh, to, to be fair, there's been we've had some fabulous times overseas. Um, you know, some some really memorable moments. Probably one, and and I, you could say it was. It's only memorable because it keeps getting pulled up by so many people. Um, one time we were we were at the Lucerne World Cup, finished racing, great times with these uh, Canadian guys we had, and. Um, and we decided, you know what, let's jump in the water and let's catch a swan, you know, and then let's take the swan back to the pub. <laughs> let's take the swan back to the pub. And then, of course, when we're walking in, they're big animals, man. They're real big. And they hiss and they bite you. And, um, yeah, that was funny. That was, and, and like, yeah, sorry, no animal cruelty happened here. I'm going to disclose that. The swan enjoyed but, it. But, yeah, it was, it was, that was an interesting, it'll always go down in memory because it always gets pulled up, Had no matter been, where you go. Um, had there been a number of sort of jars consumed before you went for the swan? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 No. No. Those. Those have probably been. I've. As I say, it's very hard. I honestly, it's very, very hard to pinpoint one specific time. Oh no. Right. No. Mm. You've given us the swan. We have that on record. What's the best advice given to you, and who gave it to you? My granddad. Still around? No. Nothing good ever happens after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, I would, I would, um, I would, I would tweak that. I'd say like I don't know, eleven p.m. possibly. Yeah. Maybe I'm a nanny, but I, I, I've, I've found in politics, and I suspect in sport, you know, it starts going down because if you make it to eleven forty-five, you're still there at two. Yeah, and I've had, but there are probably the other piece of, and I don't know who ever said it is. Engage the brain before you open the mouth. <laughs> you know what? I, and, and those probably are a couple of, like that one there, especially because, especially at the moment, and I'm finding myself because, you know, and, and I've, because of my profile and bits and pieces, I've done a couple of stupid things on social media in the past. Um, no, I wouldn't say like super stupid, but just you just can't comment on things. You know, yeah. everybody's got an opinion. Everyone's open and. Oh, and I know the it, feeling on that mate, one too. You know, you and, and and I'm just like, and you look at it, and you'll see someone saying something, and the first thing you want to do is just jump on the thread, and it's like, don't put the phone down, walk away. You know, um, and so a lot of it sometimes is, and and it and it goes right back, you know, to what your parents and. And I'm sure everybody would probably say, like your grandmother or whoever, it's like, if you don't have anything nice to say, just don't say anything. Mm. And I know it's cliche. No, it's cliche. But that's because it's true. But because it basically is true. Yeah. Eric, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on. You've been listening to Generally Famous. We'll be releasing a new episode every Wednesday. You'll find them at stuff.co.nz slash generally famous or wherever you get your podcasts. If you follow us on Apple or Spotify, any of the podcast apps in fact you'll get the latest episode without waiting thanks very much to producer chris reed i'm simon bridges this is generally famous i really appreciate you listening generally famous is proudly brought to you by trade depot